shoulders so if we do have something that happens in our vehicle or we need to uh, pull over for any reason we know that we don't have anywhere safe to do that without finding a county road or anything like that breakdowns leave us right on the shoulder of the roadway um, so these are all little things that people up in urban areas there's always a shoulder there's always somewhere to, for them to pull off there's always local resources close here in southeast Colorado we don't have that luxury Okay, so when we're driving out there, we have to keep things like that in mind. So, I want to go over a couple of the things that uh, we see mostly down here in Southeast Colorado. And with those, um, unfortunately it will not auto populate on the screen, so I'm just going to go through them with you. So, starting with traffic fatalities. Um, starting in 2022-2023, um, these are the numbers that we're seeing. Crash deaths in 2023, impaired driving, 37% of all the crashes that we have are impaired driving related. And 236 of those drivers that were killed were unrestrained. I know every time that I come in here, I talk to you guys, I talk to you about seatbelts, and, and, and every time I come in here, correct? 
I know you guys are familiar with that. Every time we come here, we talk about seat belts because seat belts are the number one thing that you can go on to protect yourself. <clears throat> not all crashes are your fault. There's not always something that you specifically can do to avoid that crash if somebody else comes into your lane or something like that. The only thing you can do is make good decisions for yourself to protect yourself. <clears throat> so, Otero Bent Counties. I know the Colorado map, that looks bunch of big numbers that mean a lot of stuff to other people but we want to know what happens close to home don't we <clears throat> we're concerned about our family on the roadways here in rural Colorado what the challenges that we face 2023 we had six fatalities in Otero and Bent County last year how many of you guys knew that we had six six people die on our roads just a couple <clears throat> surprising 18 we had a large increase 10 on a uh, Serious bodily injury crashes. I know I've talked to you guys in the classes about what that is. That means that somebody was severely injured. So injuries to broken bones, something disfiguring. That's a very serious crash, right? We had 18 of those here in uh, Otero and Bent County last year alone. 18 were just injury. That means that somebody had some kind of injury of any kind, if they had any kind of injury. We also had 218 property damage crashes. 218, that seems like a lot for a population as low as ours, right? We, we talk about how many people are in the vehicle at those times. So that just means how many crashes there were. That doesn't mean that there weren't multiple vehicles. It doesn't mean there weren't multiple occupants. That's just how many crashes that the State Patrol covered last year in 2023 in Otero and Bent counties. And again, these, these numbers aren't talking about what the PD covered at Walmart because someone backed into another car. So we're not inflating these numbers. These happen on our roadways, highways, county roads. The State Patrol here in Otero County, we also cover crashes on county roads. So, total of 255 crashes in 2023 were covered in Otero and Bent County last year. You guys think that seems like a lot? That's a, that seems like a lot to me. You gotta figure that that's not 255 people, guys, going back. That's 255 total crashes. So, talking about seatbelts, 2017, this is kind of an older statistic, but still holds true right now. Rural Colorado, we lead the state in one thing, not wearing our seatbelts. It's not a good statistic to be leading the state in. But here in Southeast Colorado, we lead the state in unrestrained occupants, where we aren't wearing our seatbelts. Most of them, so cars about 86%, SUVs 89%, 91% van, trucks, pickups, 76%. There's a huge discrepancy whenever we go to people that are driving around in their pickups wearing their seatbelt or not wearing their seatbelt. Southeast Colorado, we have a lot of pickups. It means we are leading that. So you gotta figure that if most of these people are still restrained, I checked it earlier today, 88% of the occupants in Colorado wear their seatbelts. 88% of us, almost nine out of 10 people. But yet we had 236 deaths last year. Almost 50% of the people that were killed on the roadway were unrestrained. So that one out of 10 that isn't wearing their seatbelt account for almost 50% of all of the crashes and fatality, or not crashes, but fatalities on our roadways in Colorado. Kind of makes you think, right? That's a huge difference. When one out of 10 people account for half of the fatalities, that tells you that those seatbelts are working, right? So, something for you guys to think about with these numbers. As you can see, 88% last year, so we've come up since 2017, but not very much, 4%. That's good, it's not great. That's one of the things as a patrol that we always focus on is seatbelts, child restraints, seatbelts. So, one of the things, 63% of all the um, deaths in Colorado are on rural roadways. Does anybody have any reasons why you think that might be? What makes our rural roads so much more dangerous? They are not maintained. Not very well, right? What's the requirement of county road? A county road only has to be graded once a year. That's it. So if you're on a county road, 
That's all they need to do is grade it once a year and they're good, right? Well, we know that in Colorado, a lot can happen over the course of the year. We're talking about freezing, thawing, 115 degrees, raining. One, one day last year, I think we got like four inches of rain, plus we've got snow, ice, but we got to grade it once a year. Very poorly maintained. So, um, come back to seat belts on this. Being that my statistics that I used were much better and more current, I'm going to go ahead and skip those. But you can see that it's always been a problem. But here's some of the things that we do worry about. Blind curbs. I mean, here at Swink, we're not far from some of the worst, first worst roads that I see out here. Highway 266, you guys know that's just right up, up the road here. It wasn't that very long ago we had a vehicle run right off of a curb, roll, right? Several people were ejected, a lot of people flight for life, most of them not wearing their seatbelt. So we know that road doesn't have any shoulders. It has some blind curves. As a matter of fact, pretty close to where they crashed is a blind curve. You're not able to see around the curve as you're coming in. So you don't know what is coming at you. And what could be coming at you in Southeast Colorado is a lot different than what it is in urban areas. We have a lot more things out here to be, uh, especially without shoulders, to be uh, worked up about or be watching for. We have agriculture vehicles. Somebody's got a 20 foot disc coming around a blind curve on a road without shoulders and you're speeding, which doesn't give you time to move. The tractor has nowhere to go, right? Other than to just drive into the ditch. If you're coming around there at 90 miles an hour with no reaction time, that's a bad day for everybody. Because that tractor is gonna win, right? It's much bigger. We have blind curves, poorly lit, rough roads. We know in Colorado as a whole, we have some of the best roads in the nation, right? <laughs> I get the laughs, I understand. We have potholes, we have washboard roads, we have construction, you guys got construction right out here in front of the school on Highway 50, that's been going on for a little bit, right? Changing lanes. Sometimes there's so many cones out there, you have no idea where you're supposed to be. So we are always having our roads under construction. The freezing, the thawing, the high temperatures, the, cr the crazy climate that we have is really hard on our roads. They're redoing the, the 109 bridge. But we talk about washboards on our county roads. We talked about that maintaining. <laughs> county Road HH is probably the one that, when I think of a, a bad rural road, I think of Otero County Road Henry Henry HH. It's got blind curves. It's got intersections you can't see on the other side of the hill. It's washboarded about a week after because there's so much traffic on it. That is a very dangerous. It's got ruts in it. Pretty much everything you could, you could hate about a road, go drive down that road and you're going to see it. But these are things that we have to think about when we're driving. And as young drivers, that falls on you. That falls on you as a driver, that falls on you as a passenger. We have to make sure that we're taking accountability for what we're doing. If we're going down these roads, we have to understand that we are in a dangerous place. These roads are not safe. And they're definitely not safe for the increased speeds that we see in rural areas. How many of you guys have heard this, the, the, the saying, no cop, no stop, right? Well, I'm out on County Road. You ain't gonna see a you ain't gonna see a trooper out there. Surprise, you will. Okay, but that may not be the thing that you need to worry about the most. The thing you may need to worry about it the most is that increased speed, increasing your chances of serious bodily injury or fatality out on that roadways. Again, you might not see a cop, but you might see a disc going around a, a dark corner or a blind corner. You might see wildlife. We got a lot of that going around. We got deer. We got cattle. I can tell you that one of the things that scares me the most about driving some of these roads at night is black cattle. They are very hard to see if they are out on the roadway. How many of you guys have been driving down the road and thinking, man, what if I come around this corner and there's a 2,000 pound bull sitting in the middle of my road? What am I gonna do? I'm gonna lose and it's gonna hurt. So with these increased free speeds out here in the rural areas, we need to make sure that we're putting it upon ourselves to slow our speeds down. And as a passenger, sometimes that falls on us too. If our driver is doing something that is unsafe, our friends are doing something that is unsafe, we need to make sure that we speak up and we tell them to slow down. It's your life that's also in jeopardy, right? It's not just a ticket that's waiting for you guys. It could be something much more severe. I talked a little bit about agriculture vehicles already, but it's true. I come from a farming background. I've driven farm equipment on highways before. 
And I've seen the disregard that people have for those large equipment. We have CMV, commercial motor vehicles, semis, hauling oversized loads, or just lo loads in general. They're large vehicles. Again, when you have a road like 266, I like to use that as a great example, has no shoulders. Those trucks coming around those corners might have difficulty staying in their lane. And so as you're coming around, if you're not, if you have that increased speed and we're not paying attention, you're not gonna have anywhere to go. Rural roads are much more dangerous. Heavy equipment makes it even more dangerous. Highway 194 is another great example. A lot of blind curves, no shoulders. Okay, we could go on and on. We have Highway 10, Highway 350, 109. All of these roads are highways without shoulders. We're not even talking about the county roads that are only, you know, 16 feet across. And you have a tractor coming down with a 20 foot disc or larger coming at you. Okay, we have to reduce our speeds. We have to make sure that we're paying attention to everything that's going around us. What else do we have on rural roads we don't have in cities? Wildlife, cattle. Probably no bighorn sheep, but elk. I've covered car elk crashes, okay? Car cow, car horse, car deer, a lot. These are all things that people that are driving in the city don't have to think about coming out in the middle of the road. Yeah, they might have to worry about a kid if they're in a populated area, right? Which we still have to worry about that too. People live on these roads. They may be playing there and kids on a road that doesn't see a car very often is probably more apt to be Worry, not might wander out in the road without not thinking is what I'm saying. <clears throat> we have migration time. We have the Tarantula Fest, right? You want to know something that's really fun about Tarantula Fest? I get more calls for people sitting on the middle in the middle of the roadway or laying down in the <laughs> middle of the roadway taking a photo. Can you believe that? Someone lay laying down in the middle of a highway to take a picture of a spider. Okay. I understand that that's pretty neat, but the fact that you're willing to risk your life on a highway, because if you come around a blind curve, no shoulder, all of a sudden you're seeing someone laying down in the middle of the road. It just blows my mind how many times I get dispatched that every time that we have tarantula fest. The things that happen out there, the people that are out there, and the things that people will do, we have to be responsible for when we're, we're operating our vehicles, right? We have to react to anything that is put in front of us. We have the dark rural roads. That's coming in better. There we go. We have dark rural roads. We, we don't have street lights. How many of the roads that you guys have here around Swink have lights around them? 50? <laughs> For about two blocks, right? The rest of the highways, the rest of the city streets, the rest of the county roads are unlit. You don't know what's laying in the road. You got someone out there taking a picture or laying in the road, or even a dead animal in a road that somebody hit earlier and left in the middle of the road for you. You're not going to see it until your, your headlights see it, until you're able to see it. Obviously, this is going to add to a lot more dangers to driving on our roadways. <clears throat> driving at night is probably one of the more dangerous things when we compound that with deadly rural roads. Because again, we have hidden intersections. We have uh, washboard roads that we may not know. We have roads that go from asphalt to dirt to back to asphalt, back to dirt. That transition is going to lead to washboards. It's going to lead to your vehicle reacting completely different from one surface to another. So 2015, I was having trouble trying to update these, so this is an older statistic. 2015, approximately one percent of crashes occurred at night. Um, 19, so dark and unlit, 10,000, 19,000. So you're close to half are happening at night, yet we have a lot less miles traveled at night. We have a lot less traffic at night. These increases in all the things that we can't see up ahead more than a couple hundred hundred yards, maybe a hundred yards up ahead of us, compounded with bad decisions of driving fast because we're in a hurry, maybe we're out joyriding, not paying attention with our friends, anything that we're doing out there is gonna increase the chances of you having a crash at night. Talk more about the compromised vision. 
One of the things that people for always forget whenever they're out driving is the other person. You may be capable of operating your motor vehicle safely, but is the other person out on the road? There's a high number of impaired drivers out there. I can, t I can assure you that they cannot. They cannot operate that motor vehicle safely. They are not gonna be in your best interest to be out there with them. They get a lot of things that they're gonna be doing. They're gonna increase their speeds, right? Because they're gonna have a compromised uh, decision making. We also have rain, dust, fog, and snow. We got all that stuff maybe in an afternoon here in Southeast Colorado, right? Probably just not that long ago. We get wind, we get dust, then it rains, then it snows, then we got ice. That's all gonna happen overnight. It's gonna freeze up again, and then in the morning our roads are more, much more dangerous. So all this stuff adds in. And obviously fatigue at nighttime is gonna increase our chances of, of crashing. We, we add that fatigue to all the other things that we've already seen, we start to drift off. Maybe we lose focus on the road for a short amount of time. Maybe we're trying to do something to stay awake. That's gonna definitely slow our reflexes. It's gonna slow our, or increase our chances of having a crash. I know I've talked about impaired driving. You guys know that every time that I'm in here, I mention something about impaired driving because this is a huge problem that we have, not just statewide, not just Southeast Colorado, nationwide. It's huge, it's a big problem. With all the different drugs that are out there, someone can be impaired on anything from prescriptions to cannabis to alcohol. All of these things are gonna affect their ability to operate that motor vehicle safely. And again, just because you are safe to operate your motor vehicle, you cannot account for what the other person is gonna do. Um, so there's the biggest thing that we always talk about with rural roads that I come in here, I also like to mention, is the response time of first responders. Here in Swinney specifically, you don't have a fire department sitting at the fire station waiting to go on a call. You don't have ambulances sitting down there with people ready to jump in that ambulance and go right now, located here in Swink. And even if you did, the rural roads in Swink and the areas that we have to get to could be 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes Sometimes response times for first responders could be even longer. But when you compound that with volunteer fire departments, volunteer ambulance services, those people are at home with their family. They gotta go get their equipment. They gotta respond to the scene. They gotta first go get their equipment, then respond to the scene. Some of them will go straight there if they're close, but they're not gonna have all the equipment they need. They're not gonna have the ambulance yet, right? But they're gonna go there with the bag and try to help. Law enforcement is on duty. There's we're, we're at, we may be coming from a long ways away as well. So you gotta understand that sometimes when we have these crashes, your help may not just be around the corner. The other problem we have with rural Colorado is although cell service is great in, in urban areas, it's really not in rural Colorado, is it? How many of you guys get cell service on every highway out here? I know I don't. It's better with certain carriers than others. It just depends on where you are. But you get out on the rural roads especially, you're gonna lose service. You may not be able to call for 911. You might be stuck waiting for someone to come by. And that could be hours. This is gonna increase the chances of your injuries being severe or even possibility of, of death. So when we talk about our rural roads, guys, I just want to mostly just say that when you guys are out there as you become drivers, when you're out there with your friends, you guys are out there driving around, we have to talk about the things that are the most dangerous, right? Put your seatbelt on. I'm gonna to continue to harp on you guys every time I come in here and talk to you guys, put your seatbelt on, all right? You guys are too young for drugs and alcohol. Keep that out of there, all right? Did you know that's one of the things that I go looking for? Seatbelts and impaired drivers, okay? Reduce the speeds, okay? Let someone know where you guys are at, especially out here. Some of these places are very remote, very isolated. If nobody knows where you're at, it could be a long time for anybody to come find you. Um, looks like that was about what the time they told me to be. So do you guys have any questions for me? So uh, any questions for me? If you guys do have questions you don't want to ask in front of the group, that's fine. I'm going to be standing over here with Under Sheriff Wallace um, so that we can help with any, any questions that you have. All right? Thank you, guys.
Table four is Joey Gasnick, and table five is Lisa Bauer. Like I said before, if a table is full already, please try to move to another one. You will receive a raffle ticket at the table, and um, then you will be able to hopefully get a prize at the end. And each table will be about seven minutes long, so. You'll hear Brianna call her real loud. Switch! Or use your microphone. <laughs> My name is Joey Gasnick. I know a lot of you already, but I don't know everybody. I used to work for Lahana Fire Department. I was a firefighter for 20 years. I worked with those guys. We went on car accidents together. I saw a lot of auto or auto versus wildlife, auto versus deer, some fatalities, some really, really bad accidents. But with a few things, you guys can prevent that. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So my current job now, I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I deal, with, I deal with wildlife causing problems, right? If I have to go solve a problem, what's one thing I have to do? I have to be where the animals are, right? I, to be good at my job, I have to go where the animals are. They're not going to come to me. They're not going to stop causing problems. I've got to go where they are. So where are the, where's the wildlife? Everywhere, you're right. There's a lot of wildlife in southeast Colorado. You know the population of Otero County? It's like at least 19,000 people, I believe. At least one, two, and your brother, three, right? I guarantee you there are more coyotes in this county than people. There's more coyotes in this county than people. So your odds of encountering that wildlife, super, super high. Let me show you a map really quick, guys. See this? See that big red, oddly shaped square? You see that blue squiggly line in the middle? The red line is the property boundary of this huge ranch not far from here. The blue line is an airplane track. We have a GPS tracker in our airplane. We use an airplane sometimes to solve wildlife problems. So right now it looks just pretty random, right? That big red property is 60,000 acres. It's like 64,000 acres, so it's huge. So if I zoom in, what do you notice? You notice that line gets a little finer and you start to see all those squiggly lines, those little clover leaves, right? Can anybody guess what each one of those little circles is? It's a coyote. <laughs> it's a coyote. Every one of those little red, those little blue circles is a coyote. And look, I want you to notice that there's places where those blue squiggly lines are more prevalent than the others, right? What do you notice about that area where there's all those blue squiggly lines? Can you see all that cover, all those cactus, the tamaracks, the trees? If I zoom in farther, you can see it even more. That's where they stay. They stay where there's cover. Absolutely right. Wildlife has to have cover. It has to have cover. Where's the biggest cover corridor in Otero County? The Arkansas River. It's like a mile and a half from here, right? Walking distance. You can be there in 10 minutes if you're put out. It's not far away. There's roads that parallel it, that cross it, all over the place. So you as drivers, how many of you have a driver's license? Soon to be just about everybody here, right? You as new drivers have to be aware. When you're near those corridors, the Arkansas, Tempest Creek, the Pishpaw River, the Purgatory River, on and on and on, depending on what highway you're on. You've got to be aware that, hey, I'm in the danger zone right now. I am where the wildlife is, so you've got to be prepared. Again, I used to be a firefighter. What we used to do, what I want, a big part of my job was to train new firefighters and teach them how to drive fire trucks. Okay? Super dangerous. One of the most dangerous things a firefighter does is drive that truck. It's hard to see blind spots. So how we taught them to deal with that is we taught them how to scan ahead. If you're scanning ahead and you're anticipating that, that kid's gonna come riding his bike across the road right in front of you, you're gonna be ready for it. You're gonna be covering the brake. If you're scanning ahead, you're gonna, you're gonna see that car before it pulls out in front of you. Same thing when it comes to wildlife. Scanning ahead means looking way out there. If I'm going 65, 75 miles an hour, I've gotta scan pretty far ahead, right? because the distance it takes me to go a mile is less than a minute. Miles a long ways. How do you scan ahead? There's a diet, there's a picture right here. It's a guy on a motorcycle. Every one of those red circles is a hazard. It's something that that driver needs to be aware of. But if he doesn't pay attention to it, it's gonna cause an accident, okay? You can't see it, but look at these tree lines on both sides. There could be deer standing over there, right? 
A quarter mile is the recommended scanning distance on highway and highway speeds. What does that mean? Everybody's been on the track, you know what a quarter mile looks like roughly in a straight line? It goes fast if you're driving 65 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour as it is here on Highway 50 between Mahana and Swing. It goes fast. If you're in town, an eighth of a mile. Scanning, looking. Okay, where's that at? Another thing to think about is the time of year. Do wildlife move more during certain times of year than others? You bet they do. Go talk to the auto body shop. Go talk to the troopers. I guarantee they'll tell you there's more deer versus auto accidents when the deer are mating, when it's breeding season. Those bucks are chasing those does. I guarantee there's more car accidents that time of year, okay? That time of year is like October through early, early December. Guarantee there's more car accidents that time of year. So be aware of that. When you're out and you're in those areas that time of year, be on the lookout. I'm gonna watch, we're gonna watch a couple of videos here real quick. There's two, where there's two, there's 20. No joke. So just because you see one crossroad, don't think, oh great, look, that deer, great, life's good. Because there's nine more coming, okay? Now watch this video, it happens really fast. You're gonna see one deer, two, three, four. And the last one gets plowed into. One, two, three, four. Cartwheels, right? No good. Here's, here's another one, we're gonna watch this one. There we go. All right, so here's a, a nice young lady who's driving and filming at the same time. That has its own issues, right? How can she be focusing on the road when she's videotaping this deer run down the road? What about other cars on the road? Right now, no hazard. She's behind it, she's slowed down, she sees it, life is good. But what about other drivers? See that big blind curve? Look what's around that big blind curve. See that car? We'll let it play out and then we'll talk. He did that on purpose. He did that on purpose. That deer wanted to die. My point is, you think that other car was scanning ahead? No way. Who knows what they were doing? Right? On the phone, on the radio. Perfect timing. Scan ahead, guys. Please. Yeah, get your tickets. How many of you here have ever pulled a, a trailer? Either a bumper pull or a gooseneck? So several of them. Very good. Very good. So, do you guys have any questions about it right off about pulling a trailer? Okay. Well, I'll give you a few pointers that I've learned over the years of, about that. So, did you haul livestock or grain? Grain? Yep. You guys? I just moved the trailer. Yep. Yeah, I moved it when we moved. So, I have a bunch of like living stuff. Okay. All right. So, uh, what things do you think you need to check on the trailer before you go? The lights. Yep. Yep. And make lights. sure it's secured to the back. Yep. Yep. Make sure you're hitched properly. Safety. Yep. The safety chains are all hooked. Exactly. The lights are very, very important. So trailers have a tendency because all the vibration that occurs, the wiring gets frayed and doesn't function properly. And without your lights, and when you're turning or stopping, People, other vehicles behind you, or I'm coming, but I don't know exactly what you're doing. So it's very, very important that you have proper functioning lights. Also, in that electrical system, what is it? Uh, tank also brakes. So your trailer brakes. So you have a 20 or 24 foot trailer, say a 24 foot trailer, you can put 12 cows on. You know how much weight that is? You're talking six to seven ton of weight that is going to be pushing you down the road. If your trailer brakes aren't working properly, you're, you're relying on just your pickup brakes to stop you, greatly increases your stopping distance. So you need to have functioning, properly functioning trailer brakes. And with that, you test those brakes uh, before you leave to make sure they're functioning properly. In there you have a control unit within the pickup. So when you're empty, you set that control unit high, and when you're loaded, you bump it up and set it heavier so you have more braking capacity and they come on stronger. If you set them on strong while you're empty, what happens is you're gonna skid your back tires on your trailer. They're gonna lock up. Then it's gonna put flat spots on your tires, and your tires are gonna be run very quickly. So you gotta set them light when you're empty, you gotta remember when you get loaded to turn them off. So that 
so you have the stopping power. As you go, it's best when you get loaded or even empty, going, if you're going somewhere to get loaded, after a few miles to stop and check your bearings. When you do that, you go back there just with the touch and feel them. If that bearing is getting hot, what does that mean? The ball bearings are going bad, there's no grease in it, what can happen? One is it can run that spindle, that wheel's just going to come off. Secondly, it can stay on, it can heat up enough that that tire catches on fire. So either way, it's a bad scenario. Also, especially hauling livestock, you want to do with grain also, is check your flooring. With livestock in there, what happens if the floor goes bad and you're going down the road? Yeah, their feet and legs are going to the pavement or to the gravel, which is detrimental to the livestock. Not good. If you're hauling grain of some type, you're losing product getting to wherever you want to go. Secondly, is checking latches. Make sure your latches are functioning properly, especially your end gate on your on your trailer, whether it's grain or livestock. That is latching properly. Checking the air on your tires. Are they properly aired? Are your spares properly aired? Because if you do have a flat, then you want to make sure that your spare has air in it. So then if you want to change the tire, then you can do that. Uh, the best type of jacks to have with you, I guarantee you, if your trailer is loaded, your pickup jack is not going to pick it up. You need to either carry a floor jack or a bottle jack with you in order to lift that trailer to get it up where you can change that tire. Uh, also, it's good to have reflectors with you. So you'll see semis out there if they have uh, a breakdown, whether it's an engine, flat tire, whatever, that then you can set those reflectors. As Officer Poynton pointed out, a lot of our roads in this area don't have shoulders. It doesn't matter if it's a county road. Our highways don't either. So if you have it, especially on the uh, driver's side, and you get a flat tire with the traffic oncoming or coming behind you, then getting those reflectors out so then they know that you're out there in the roadway working on a vehicle. And again, if your lights happen to fail while you're going down the road, those reflectors then get secondary. So you want your flashers, hopefully properly working, also have those reflectors out there. Road conditions, as the officer talked about. On highways and county roads, icy conditions. Again, carrying that load, even if your trailer brakes are working, and those conditions, your, great, your stopping distance is greatly increased. Same with muddy conditions on county roads that are secondary roads. Those stopping conditions are greatly increased with that muddy, with the muddy conditions. Bumper pull versus gooseneck. I prefer gooseneck 100%. Bumper pulls, in my opinion, can be very dangerous. And the reason is, especially on Gravel roads, you want to be very careful because with that, the trailer loaded or empty on a bumper pull, if you start driving it's pretty fast, even in the county road uh, speed limit, if they're un not posted, is 55. They will get to fishtailing on you, and when that fishtails, they're going to pull you into it. It's going to throw you into the bar ditch, get you in the bar ditch, and even can cause a roll. So it's very important. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, sir. from this field to that field. So you don't necessarily need a license for that. But what about like ATVs? Is that legal? Four-wheelers, razors, the, like the stuff like that? 
Oh, no, no. So on a highway? Actually, yeah, so oh, it actually gets, it gets a little weird. Oh, I thought um, you were know. Yeah, on weird. roads. No, like on roads and stuff. So, like, it gets a little weird. Colorado does allow, like, cities and counties to create their own laws when it comes to that. So, like, there's a town up in the mountains, I can't remember the name of it right now, where you're legal to drive, like, these razors and stuff on the town roads because the city permits it. But in Otero County, not on the highways, not on the county roads, not in any alleyways, because Colorado law still considers that a roadway. Um, can't do that on those. Uh, I do know the town of Rocky Ford does allow people to permit their like golf carts and stuff. And yeah. You're allowed to I've drive those. those in the town. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's permitted, uh, the state allows that. Yeah. But it has to stay on the city streets and can't be on the state highways. And stuff. Okay. What about these electric bicycles that everybody's getting now? they be written on the roadways? Yeah, they can. You can actually ride those on the roadways, okay? Um, you can't ride on any like, bike paths or anything like that. Um, but you, they, they can't go any more than 12.5 miles per hour. Um, and you have to follow all the rules of the devices. Let's see here. What about... So we're going to talk about farming. Only if you're like going field to field, agriculture. So, like, taking it to school is kind of one of the things. Even if you put a shovel in the back, no. Uh, what about the low power? Try those. But they're limited on how much water it's in school. Um, if it's over, if it's like, for maybe say a gas engine or something, if it's under 50 cc's, you don't need a motorcycle license for it. Your regular driving license. But if it's over 50 cc, you actually have to have motorcycle endorsement on your driver's license to be able to operate the bus. Do you guys do any of the off road type vehicle stuff? Um, what's up? Your brothers? Uh, where can they ride in that town? Legally. Pretty much just private property. I know a lot of the state wildlife areas and then down in the Comanche grasslands prohibit those. So pretty much it's a private property thing, but um, totally recommend uh, people that like doing trails and stuff go up to Turkey Creek up in the mountains past Canyon City. Good place to ride. So perfectly legal BLM land. Okay. Electric. So just specifically talking about the, like the electric assisted bicycles, they can't be on bike paths and stuff like that. They actually have to be on the road. No sidewalks, stuff like that. So how does that work? Do you go like outside? Yeah. So all bicycles um, and bicycle riders are permitted to use the road just like cars. Right? They guys have every right to ride on the road just like a car does. You want to start considering making sure you have reflectors on the bike. You want to make sure that you're wearing uh, bright colored clothing when you're riding so people can see you. It causes your lung to collapse and it causes so much pressure in your chest that yeah. all the pressure on the outside of your lung is pushing on your heart. Okay? So when that happens, this needle is inserted into your chest to remove that little air from your lung cavity. Okay? So. One of the ways that we can avoid this is by wearing our seatbelts. I know they hurt on you, and I will too, um, because seatbelts save lives. They absolutely do. The worst injuries that we see are these types of injuries, and these types of injuries typically come from those people who are not wearing their seatbelts. Did you like really bad like burn and stuff like this? People like the ground. I'll take a seatbelt first. Over broken bones. Over, over that. this. Over this. Over this. Okay. Over this. Yeah. We'll take one and kill them. Yeah. Burn. See both. Yes. Absolutely any day. And one of the things, and these two do it all the time. Okay. So, so for the like, you don't have to be like sitting like this on the steering wheel. Okay. I just want good posture. So sit a little further back. The closer you sit to the steering wheel, the more impact it's going to have, and the more seatbelt burns you're going to have. But the seatbelt burn is like that's not it's going to go away in a few days. That long bone fracture is going to take that brain bleed, if ever. You're going to have neurologic deficit for always.
guys. Tell us something. How are you guys? You guys have any questions about anything I said? I know a lot of it's probably review for you guys when I've been teaching to you guys, right? Pretty much talk about seatbelts and car drivers. Don't crash, right? But no questions, anything coming up? Do you have any questions for this guy? I know you've never talked to him before. So he's, he's in training, so this is uh, part of the process. After you get out of the academy, you have to uh, uh, basically drive in an FTO. I just get to sit here and judge him 24-7 and nitpick every single thing that he does. It's kind of a lot of fun. If you make him cry, it's a lot of fun. Um, not required, but it does help. No, um, really what it does is like basically anything that they, they do, we, we make sure that they're going to by law and by um, by policies that we have and make sure they're not doing anything that uh, they're going to get in trouble for, basically. So he has to ride, have someone ride with him for 12 weeks. And like I said, basically all we do is we just pick every single thing that they do. Ask them why they do everything that they do, right or wrong. They have to be able to tell me why they do it. It's the most important. Uh, help them with, with all the different laws. I mean, you guys haven't been to math, but you've seen that big blue book on his desk. That's every law in the state of Colorado. It's very thick. It was like that thick. Okay, so there are a lot of lots that we're required to know, and it's very difficult. So we can help them as they're trying to explain what's going on there. Some of that is the, the driving code. Uh, it's gotten that thick of all the laws for just driving. What you rise because it is a privilege, right? It's not a it's not a right that you have to drive. It's a privilege that so can be taken away. So the difference between rights and privileges, right? We can take somebody's rights, but we can take privileges, um, and that's not up to us. That's up. To to the DMV whenever you guys go get your license and all that other stuff. So, how many of you guys got your licenses already? Anybody? How many permits? Can anybody tell me like one of the graduated driver's license uh, requirements for graduated driver's license? So the graduated driver's license has extra rules on it, right? So someone like myself that has a driver's license, I can do things that you guys cannot. What are some of those? The curfew. There you go. The curfew is one. What's the curfew? You guys know what time the curfew is? Uh, it's it's like from five a.m. to midnight. Midnight to five. Yep. So there are exemptions for that, right? Yeah, and you guys already forgot it. And we're doing it again. Are there any other other ones you guys remember? You have passengers, right? So one of the things I was talking about as a passenger on rural roads when you guys are driving around with your high school friends, but in that first six months, you're not allowed to have any passengers unless they're family. That's not passengers, that's just two and from school or from work. Okay? So you can't have any of your friends with you when you're driving around for the first six months of your driver's license. It's not, not when you turn 16, it's when you get your driver's license. And then in the first year, after six months to one year, you guys can have one person with you. Okay? After you turn, have that license for one year, then you can. Have all your friends. And all that does is try to reduce distractions because distract people are distractions, right? How many of you guys have ever been distracting your parents when they're driving? Okay. Come on. Put your hand up. Yes. As a parent, I assure you, you've been a distraction at some point, whether you remember it or not. Um, but, but you know, the friends are distractions, right? We can get maybe in an argument. Maybe we just get in, in a conversation that's really engaging, and we lose focus on the road. It could be that simple. And as we're already an inexperienced driver, we compound that with the fact that we're not paying attention and we're going to increase the, chance, the chances of crashes. So it's definitely something that uh, we're going to do. Have you guys, any of you guys taken like defensive driving 1125, any of those things? Defensive driving, so there's course classes that you guys can take. Um, the one that I, comes to my mind always is the Live at 25. That was the one I knew when I was, and it's still around. But you can, it reduces your insurance, which is defensive driving. It teaches you like how to drive in ways that you're not going out there going to get in a crash, and ways to, to drive safer. Um, never even heard of it. Yes, um, it's considered um, driving with unauthorized passengers. So if you're within that first six months and you have people that aren't in the um, it's an unauthorized passenger. And uh, you listen to the judge and explain your actions to the judge. Um, is it summoned? So the graduated driver's license, same thing with uh, if you don't have your seatbelt on, uh, same thing if uh, the curfew 
all those things are part of that driver's license. One, because we talked about uh, the increased uh, fatigue and all that stuff with night driving, right? That's why the curfew's there. Um, the passengers, because of distractions. Um, you can't use your cell phone at all, obviously a distraction, right? Which I think that should be for everybody, not just inexperienced drivers. I don't think anybody should be using their phone, right? But uh, texting or anything like that. Um, and with you guys, you have to have everybody in the car buckled up, not just, so like myself, if there's certain requirements, somebody in the back may not have to have their seatbelt, but with you guys, everybody does. So make sure, and it comes back to you guys. And it's also the only seatbelt ticket out there that has points associated with it um, against your license. So your insurance companies are definitely going to look at that. If you guys get a, con a, a seatbelt citation with points, they're going to look at you as a high risk driver because what is, it, what is cheaper to fix, a car or a person? So insurance companies look at injuries. Okay. Yeah. So to replace a car might cost you 30, 40,000, right? For a brand new car, even if they would pay the whole thing, right? That could be just one trip to the ER for someone with a broken arm, depending on what's going on. Very expensive to fix people. So if they have serious injuries or something like that, insurance companies look at the fact that seat belts are gonna reduce the amount of injuries. So they're gonna put you in a higher risk as a juvenile person. Um, so, because of the how much money, more money they're gonna have to pay out in that crash, because they gotta pay for the injuries too, right? Not just the vehicle. Um, so it costs them a lot more money if people get hurt. So that's gonna increase your insurance. So that's why the seat belts is, is a good thing. And like I said, you guys are responsible for that citation, so make sure everybody bounces up. Okay. Do you guys still run your um, yes, I, I'm actually an instructor. So I have a class coming up at the end of the day.